So who will be introducing? Sorry to ask. Yeah, I will do that. Okay. It doesn't need to be done again and again. <laughs> All right. Needs no introduction. <laughs> be alive. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 128 and Glaucoma Session 32. Today we have again with us Dr. Varita Patakre, ma'am, and she'll be talking on glaucoma drainage implant surgery. I request Dr. Pradeep Pya, sir, to please introduce, ma'am. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce again Dr. Varita Patakre. She has been doing this job for the last two months, and now this is my responsibility to introduce her. Last lecture also I introduced her, but her introduction was incomplete. So today I will try to complete that introduction. Uh, Dr. Vanita Patak Ray is a highly decorated glaucoma expert, uh, not only in India, but across the world. She has done his MBBS from University of Kolkata. She did her FRCS ophthalmology from Royal College of Surgeon Edinburgh in 1997. She did her glaucoma fellowship from University of Toronto. She did another FRCO from Royal College of London in 2006. She has a vast experience in glaucoma and uh, she was a pioneer and she was the first glaucoma specialist to perform the minimal invasive glaucoma surgery in angle cruiser disease. That was the FACO endocycloplasty. I think she might have innovated that. The first Indian glaucoma specialist to use a hoop dual bed to perform trabeculectomy in adult and first to perform Arolab equus tennis implant, that is Audi, while she was in LV Prasad Eye Institute. She has a wide range of peer reviewed publications. She has presented papers, published papers across the globe. She has won a very prestigious International Hero Award, not only once, twice, but three times in a row, that is in 2017, 18, and 19. It is my pleasure to present to you that illustrated glaucoma personality, Dr. Vanita Patagre. She would be talking to us on glaucoma drainage devices. Dr. Vanita, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Pratik. I don't think the introduction was required again, as I said, but... Thank you for your kind words. Yeah, everyone knows you. <laughs> no, that, everyone knows you and Dr. Harsh. Mm. Right. So I'll share my screen first. Um. <clears throat> so it's a, a very broad topic, you know, drainage implant surgery. So I'll try and do justice by giving you ideas about uh, what is available and, um, um, you know, for your understanding of uh, what is glaucoma drainage device, because quite a few of you may not actually uh, come across this surgery whilst you're doing your PG. So the scope of uh, this presentation is looking at indications for uh, th these devices, the types that are available, the mechanism of action to understand how uh, complications of uh, these GDDs, difference of the de devices that are available in India. And if we have time, I will show you the express miniature shunt as well which is um, you know, also a drainage device. So I uh, showed the slide to you in my previous talk also saying that uh, glaucoma drainage devices form a bleb around the plate, which is far away from the limbus. And um, it is formed eight to 10 millimeters away. And it has good, very good IOP reducing potential, but there is possibility at the same time, there's possibility of serious side effect profile. The devices that are available in India and the valve device has been available for a while, that is AMR glaucoma valve. And uh, a very recent addition of the non-valve drainage device or the RD in India, Orolab Aqueous Drainage Implant. 
So the basic question, why do we need glaucoma drainage devices? And answer is actually very simple. These are for refractory glaucomas. What do we mean by refractory glaucomas? Where IOP is frequently not controlled, even in the short term with maximum medical therapy, with or without diamox. And you can also do them when traps have failed. Um, and you, know, you may do one, two, I sometimes uh, get patients who've had three traps and it has failed, and then I have done uh, a tube for them. And where trap is anticipated to fail, even with antifibrotics. So you can consider it as a primary procedure also. Why, what, what is it about secondary or refractory glaucomas? Generally, they tend to have um, either more inflammation and these include uveitis and neovascular glaucoma as well as trauma. They tend to have membranes growing over the angle, causing severe closure. Again, neovascular glaucoma or iridocorneal endothelial syndrome. Or they tend to have conjunctiva that is not virgin, meaning it, the previous surgery has been done and already scarred due to previous surgery. So aphakic, pseudophakic, post-retinal surgery, corneal surgery, and of course, Boston Capo. So <clears throat> therefore the indications could be neovascular glaucoma. I don't know whether you can see the red blush still there with ectropian UVA. And this gentleman had, um, and the cornea is still hazy. This is uh, within a week of uh, surgery, but he uh, recovered very well from count fingers vision. His vision came in, his only eye came to 612 if I remember correctly. With tube in the sulcus, then you have, um, Post VR surgery, I mean, uh, post PK, as you can see there, you can do it in aphakic, pseudophakic eyes, um, and post trauma. This gentleman was referred to me after uh, his uh, iris had prolapsed through a wound in the sclera, which was then that that was a abscess, but after that he developed a glaucoma and I was not getting controlled. Then iridocorneal endothelial syndrome. You can see the polychoria there, and you can see the tube in the sulcus. Um, a failed trap. Now, this uh, young lady, J O A G lady, you can see a very thin walled uh, bleb superiorly. So, her um, tube was done inferiorly, and she was, of course, phakic. Uh, it's always a little bit more tricky when uh, patients are phakic. Uveitic glaucoma. This is an intraop surgery. This patient already had a trap. So, uh, a, a tube was done. <clears throat> and this congenital glaucoma child had count fingers, almost three meter vision, in spite of this cornea looking so hazy with these habstria uh, visible. You can see the tube right there in the corner. And of course, uh, at that age, faking. And of course, cost, uh, you know, any, any cape keratoprosthesis, this one was a Boston cape book. So valve uh, uh, device was introduced in India in 1990s and the non-valve one is only available since 2013. The non-valve that is, uh, that is used worldwide is the, the bar welt and most commonly used is a 350. 350 is the surface area and Adi is actually designed or modeled on bar welt 350. So what are these? These are actually silicon implants. You can see here, it's a small beetle shaped one. Uh, this is FP8 model. This is FP7 model of MF glaucoma valve. Uh, and this is the 350 of the um, bar welt. You can see comparatively, when you look at the size, you know, it is quite large, almost double the size of an FP7. Uh, perhaps there, therein lies its, uh, you know, its success. So how do these uh, implants help us with pressure control? Basically, there is a fibrous capsule formation around the plate in three to six weeks. It takes some time for it to form, which then acts as a reservoir, which through which in which aqueous pools in the potential space between the plate and the capsule. And then this passively diffuses out and is absorbed by capillaries and lymphatics. IOP reduction is therefore dependent on two factors. One is the surface area of capsule formation, which is then directly uh, related uh, to the 
or directly proportional to the end plate size and the thickness of the capsule. So <clears throat> it is therefore understood that lower post-operative IOP is expected with a thinner capsule and larger surface area of thin encapsulation. Now, this is a bar weld. You can see that it's a little bit curved. Um, the RD is not as curved. Bar weld has uh, several models, 250, 350. They also used to have 500, which is now being discontinued, and they have a fast planar model as well. This is the RD. You can see it is not as curved as bar weld. I have used bar weld as well as RD, but the functioning of the two, I have not found any different. Uh, that's the bar weld again, as you see there. Okay, so it has a large surface area, 350 millimeters square, as I've been telling you. It is inserted under adjacent muscles, recti muscles, and it has fenestrations because it allows growth of fibrous tissue to keep bleb height under control. However, because it is valve-less, there is initial hypotony if you don't take any measures. So therefore, to prevent initial hypotony, you have to take um, manage it preemptively by using occluding ligatures. Once you occlude it, obviously in the early postoperative period, before that suture opens up, you will get high IOP. If the patient has had 40, 50 pressures prior to sur surgery with maximum medication, then obviously postoperatively also that is not going to be controlled. So one has to manage it uh, in a preemptive fashion. So initial high IOP also is managed by intraop maneuvers and you can also use postoperative anti-glaucoma medication. Suture autolysis of the occluding suture, that's what I'm talking about, is anticipated and occurs around five to six weeks. And if it doesn't um, autolyze, um, then you can use either laser or you can even do uh, you know, a surgical suture lysis. <clears throat> and once the uh, suture opens up, that's when you expect the pressure to be controlled that's when aqueous goes up to the plate. Therefore, in RD, you get a delayed hypertensive phase. And this happens more near the three-month uh, post-operative period. So there, the, what are the intraoperative modifications that we do to prevent this hypotony? Is you use a vitreal occlusive ligature of the tube. You can also use a rib cord meaning you use a cord inside the tube. I will show you everything, whatever I'm talking about. And the sutures that you can use, Supramit, it was not uh, initially available in India. Now, uh, Arvind laborat Laboratories are making it. You can even, even if you don't uh, have access to that, you can use proline, you can use nylon, you can even use silk. I have done, I've used all of them. Um, or some people use heavy molecular weight sodium hyaluronate, expecting it to clear in a very slow fashion, or there are some people who do it in a two-stage procedure. First, they suture the plate in and they don't put the tube in the AC until the fourth or the fifth week when encapsulation is supposed to have taken place around the end plate. So here we are, this is X vivo. I'm using a rip cord here. This is nylon 5-0. Uh, thread it through the uh, tube and after that you occlude it. So what happens is after the suture autolysis occurs and here I'm going to test and see whether there is any drainage and you can see no fluid is coming and then you take off your sutures and move on. Uh, <clears throat> so the intraoperative modifications now that you've occluded it you need uh, IOP control, isn't it? So you could do take a few um, measures like venting slits or fenestrations, or you can leave a vicral stent, or you could do you could do both. Um, some people do an, what is known as an orphan trabeculectomy without anti-metabolites, which are expected not to survive beyond four weeks, so to speak, um, or you can do the easiest thing is restitution of preoperative medication. 
until the tube opens around the fifth to sixth week when the GDD or RD becomes functional. So here, uh, ex vivo again, I'm showing you, this is a vitral um, stent, okay? And there is there I have made fenestrations as well. That's why it's draining just there. This is how you make, it's very simple. You can just leave it in vivo and you can see the occluding sutures there. Here in this case, um, not only have I put a rib cord and occluded, but I'm leaving the vitral stents in position. And then I will show you how that, in that particular case, the vitral stent was removed. So with this knowledge, let us have a look at the uh, procedure in brief of RD. I will also show you AGV in brief. So this, now this is a, a um, neovascular glaucoma patient who's already had PRP and a, anti vegf injections is also a pseudophake, as you can see. So you make your conjunctival incision, you hook the recti, adjacent recti. So I'm going to do in the supratemporal pocket. So it's the lateral rectus as well as the superior rectus that is hooked and cleaned. The underbelly is cleaned. Following this, you take your plate. I like to prepare the plate before I actually fix it. So first I check for patency, means I'm seeing whether the tube is actually draining or not. Next, I occlude it with 6-0 vitral. And I may use more than one. Um, I, I like to use two, minimum two nowadays, because I want the autolysis to occur in a stepped fashion, as a result of which you don't get a precipitous drop of pressure when the suture opens up. So here, this is the first one. You can see an hourglass um, uh, appearance of the tube there. And in this particular case, actually it did not occlude fully. So I, I used, no, in the, it, sorry, it did occlude. So I'm, I'm using uh, venting slits or fenestrations with the same needle, 6-0 Vicro, and creating certain slits or fenestrations anterior to the occlusive suture. And you can see how it's draining prior to that. So this is how it drains prior to the suture autolysis. And once suture autolysis occurs, all these close down. So then you put the RD wings, as I call them, under the lateral rectus and the superior rectus. And then you fix it 10 millimeters behind the sclera. You can use um, any non-absorbable suture. Actually, even if you use absorbable, it really does not matter because once the capsule forms around it, um, it stays in position. There is no problem. Here I'm using uh, proline. I've used proline and I, what is very important is that you bury the knots. Uh, if the knots are uh, exposed, then you may get conjunctival erosion. This is, uh, which can be a big problem in uh, the management, in post-operative management. Okay, so then we do the second one also, we move on. Then what you do is once that is done, you, <clears throat> I routinely do a paracentesis and I do a slow decompression of the globe, very slow decompression of the globe. If required, I give mannitol preoperatively also. Then you trim the tube to the size that you want. Um, and then you enter the, um, I, if the patient is pseudophagic, I prefer to leave the tube in the sulcus. I don't like to put it in the AC. Uh, also remember, neovascular glaucoma patients, when they get uh, angle 360 degree angle closure, the AC starts becoming very shallow. So there I entered with the needle, 23 gauge needle in the sulcus, and now I'm placing the tube in the sulcus anterior to the IOL. I'm using a second instrument just to guide it into position. And once that is done, you have to fix the tube um, with tensile nylon onto the, you don't want any movement of the tube. Movement of the tube is what uh, causes problems later on. You can get exposures. You, you flatten it off, you know, it has to have a low profile. And once you have done that, the next step is to use either uh, you know, a, a corneal or a scleral patch cloth, you either glue it or you suture it, it's your choice, whatever is available, and then you close the conjunctiva with 80 vicral. And you can see the tube in the sulcus there. 
<clears throat> now, how does it how how does it look before actually the ligature slips? Is you still see maybe not in the first two weeks, but you see this ridge. Adi ridge is visible before the ligature slips, and once the ligature slips, it becomes a diffuse bleb, and you no longer see either the ridge or the obviously the suture because that has slipped down. How do you remove the ripcord in case IOP control is not there post uh, six weeks and your suture is uh, autolyzed is at the slit lamp, you um, make a small nick in the conjunctiva. And you pull the ripcord from there, which was kept in the infrotemporal pocket and you will see it withdrawing from the tube now look watch the arrow it's withdrawing from the tube and then you pull it out completely this gentleman he had for pressures of 45 before the procedure and after the procedure the pressure dropped to 10 millimeter mercury it did not stay that low but it settled down and that large incision also does not leak at all as you can see with the fluorescein stain there. So this is where the ripcord was present and this is where the tube is now free of the ripcord. That is what we mean by ripcord. So moving on to emaglocoma valve, as you saw there briefly, it has a smaller surface area, um, FP7 and even smaller for the FP8. Um, that's the FP7. Of course, it's a single quadrant insertion. It's between muscles. You don't have to go under the muscles. It's also made of silicon and it's valved because it has got these elastomer membranes, which form a unidirectional valve with the patent, patented venturi flow technology. Valves are set to shut at low IOP. So theoretically, these prevent hypotony, do not cause hypotony in the early postoperative period, but that is, uh, may not be the case always. And one a major feature is therefore that aqueous flows as soon as it is implanted. And this is possibly the reason for increased rate of hypertensive phase that we see with um, hemoglocoma valve. And that usually sets in earlier, three to four weeks. So if you don't remember, just say three weeks for hemoglocoma valve and three months, generally three months for Adi. So let's have a look at uh, a case of AGV. Again, this is neovascular glaucoma, just like for like. Um, the conjunctival incision generally does not need to be as large, but I uh, implant the plate 10 millimeters routinely for both of them. Behind, uh, I don't need to uh, to use the recti, of course. So I use a pre-placed uh, vicral suture. Then, as soon as you take the implant, you have to prime it. What does priming mean? You can have a look there. I am passing fluid through the tube to open up the valves, which is this is the area for the valve, and you can see that it is draining out. If you don't open it. You, 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 it, you really are rendering it useless because the, if the valves are not opened, then you will uh, be uh, saddled with high pressures all the time. So if on day one, Adi uh, sorry, AGV has pressures of 45 or 50, you know that the, either you've forgotten to prime it um, or it has not been primed adequately. So then we move on. What I do is those pre-placed sutures, I then pass through the holes in the plate. <clears throat> Makes it uh, very easy. Otherwise, uh, suturing it when it is in position, it, it tends to bob in and out, causing a lot of um, anxious moments. Uh, and sometimes people have said, I've seen it in conferences that the, if you uh, implant it, for, you know, put it in the pocket first and then put sutures, sometimes the implant gets lost behind posteriorly. Um, and then you tie it off. Um, just today I had to do a case of a 14 year old boy 
who um, had a belt buckle. So I had to remove the belt buckle because it was very anterior. And then I used a implant, uh, Adi behind. Once that is sutured, then the same procedure is followed for the tube. You trim the tube, you make an entry, you enter into the sulcus. In this case also, I placed in the sulcus. This patient too is doing very well. He, um, he too received um, a PRP as well as, sorry, next, next slide now. PRP as well as um, uh, in uh, anti-VEGF injection prior to surgery. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, you don't, don't get uh, high femur during surgery. So just to give you now a, you know, a little bit of uh, differentiation in the form of a table for the two valves, basically, in Ahmed, in AGV, you have these thin elastomer sheets, restricts flow less than eight millimeters. Some, sometimes it says six, sometimes it says eight, but in the in Adi or in, even in Bowel, you have chance of early hypotony. So now it is standard to take measures to offset this. You cannot just implant it. You have to do uh, take uh, carry out maneuvers to uh, reduce the early hypotony. Plate, as I was telling you, FP8 is 96 millimeters square only, FP7 is 184, which is still roughly half of that of Adi or Bowel. The advantage of plate size, therefore, because it's small, it can be placed in be between muscles, but uh, the advantage of the plate size of Adi is that there is a large area of capsule formation. So you can achieve lower target IOP, and I will show you uh, studies which have shown that. Disadvantage of the plate size is that lower target IOP is very difficult to achieve. So if you are looking at target IOP of 18, 19, 20 or thereabouts, you're probably okay. But uh, if, you, if not, you have to think about Adi. And uh, there is some theoretical uh, concerns regarding diplopia because the wings are under the muscles, but I have not faced um, diplopia with, with Adi at all. The hypertensive phase is incidence in hemoglobin value is around three to four weeks, whereas that of um, uh, Adi is much later. The initial phase is really not called hypertensive phase. It is, uh, you know, is something that has to be managed preemptively. There you are. So uh, between muscles is hemoglobin valve and under muscles is Adi. Okay. Cost-wise, of course, because hemoglobin valve is uh, imported, is comes at a greater price compared to Adi. Almost a third of the price of hemoglobin valve is the Adi. Then we move on to complications of uh, these devices. Now, we I like to divide them into three three uh, regions. Why? Because there are some complications which are common to all filtration surgery. These include high femur, hypotony, hypotony associated maculopathy, shallow or flat AC, choroidal effusion, uh, hemorrhage, bleb encapsulation, aqueous misdirection, retinal detachment, endophthalmitis, and even loss of vision. But there are a group of uh, complications that are common to Drainage devices, these include conjunctival retraction, tube and plate exposure or erosion, tube endothelial touch, which then leads to can lead to corneal decompensation and of course end up in bullous keratopathy. Or you could have tube blocked by anything, iris, clot, vitreous, silicon oil, and um, there could be tube retraction and of course hypertensive phase of uh, the, uh, drainage devices is very, very important and needs to be managed. And uh, hypotony and diplopia, which is uh, theoretically attributed to uh, non valved is uh, listed there. Okay. So let's take each one at a time. Um, we've just talked about higher IOP, so I will not go into that. Low IOP, when you have hypotony with flat AC, Hypotony with massive choroidal effusion and hypotony with formed AC. What can you do? So under the circumstances of low IOP, when you have shallow but formed AC, all you have to do is observe. Remember, we've already talked about the fact that you should be using cycloplegia here too. And that is what I mean, because I routinely give cycloplegics in the post-operative period. 
Then hypotony with flat AC, you have to intervene. You have to reform the AC. You can either use uh, helon or long acting gas in the AC here. Now uh, trying to reform only with, uh, you know, uh, something like viscomet or um, air will not do. You have to use uh, other substances. And then when there is persistent hypotony with flat AC, and this generally tends to happen with um, Adi, you have to go back and reapply the ligature. Perhaps the ligature slipped early, was not tight, tight uh, okay, or uh, the, um, uh, you know, was not put at all. You know, you just managed it with uh, heavy heel on in the first page. Sometimes when this happens, you may even have to remove the drainage device because you can't keep going in to reapply the ligature. And whenever there is hypotony with massive choroidal effusion, you have to drain the effusion and reform the AC with helon. When do, when do you need to do that? Again, we talked about this in our previous lecture. You have to do that when there are, when there are kissing choroidals, when they are touching each other because they can, that can have disastrous consequences where the retina is concerned. Then bleb encapsulation. So this is um, the equivalent to our tenon cyst that we talked about following trabeculectomy. Uh, is immediate aqueous filtration with inflammatory factors. They stimulate a fibrotic response in the subconjunctival space in the amyloid glaucoma valve. And a delayed one happens with the ligated non-valved uh, implant. So, when it is delayed, we have seen that it tends to be less aggressive and um, resolution of that hypotensive phase is also seen much more commonly with the RD. So this is a failure of IOP control due to excessive encapsulation. Bleb height increases, bleb appears tense, and this is anal analogous to encapsulation post trabeculectomy. Incidence is about 40 to 80 percent with amyloid glaucoma valve and up to 30 percent with so have a look here, look at the large bleb that has formed uh, and it looks rather tense with, this is AGV, um, this is AGV as well. So the height really corresponds to AGV um, blebs. The Adi blebs actually look pretty diffuse. So how do you manage? Well, basically with aqueous suppressants. And the earlier you start, the better it is. So now, actually, it is given as soon as IOP is in the mid-teens to suppress this hypertensive phase in AMA, especially in AMA glaucoma valve. And if it, if it carries on and, you know, you're unable to control it with medication alone, then some people have described blebectomies, meaning going in and uh, excising the fibrous tissue and also MMC injections, but uh, results related to this have been very unpredictable. So then conjunctival retraction. This is actually an intraoperative photograph of a very large conjunctival retraction in a uh, a uh, young boy for whom I did AGV with uh, sclerofixated IOL uh, following um, aphakia as well as uh, aniridia, basically, uh, post trauma and post pars planar vitrectomy and lensectomy. So, um, in this particular case, because it was rather large, I had to go in and intervene. It is mandatory, especially if leak is present. And um, again, I like to manage leaks here with doxycycline. Uh, or, you know, um, if there is a little bit of a gap, you can, you can manage with uh, doxycycline and watch it. But in major ones always require resuturing. You may need conjunctival autograph. You may need amniotic membrane graph. So in this very large one, I used um, harvested conjunctival autograph from the opposite limbus, and I placed it over the, um, the retracted conjunctiva. And you can see at the end of surgery, that is how it looks. I'm sorry, I don't have a recent photograph to show you. Here it was managed in this particular case. You can see the tube just peaking there. It was managed with several layers of amniotic membrane graft. Then tube exposure. All these are serious site threatening complications. Why? Because they can cause 
infection. So you must give antibiotic prophylaxis and you have to start considering, uh, uh, you know, either resuturing or patch graft or uh, again, conjunctival autograft or an amniotic membrane graft. And it's always advisable to use long-term lubricants in such people. This lady, one-eyed, post-PK, she, uh, this was her original patch graft was cornea. So I said, okay, let's change the material. I made it sclera, but, and look how, how uh, dry she is. You can see mucus filaments there. She was kept on lubricants quite frequent, but unfortunately it's thinning out once again. Uh, you know, it's not even looking like a scleral patch graft, but I'm just watching it for the time being, um, not doing anything uh, in particular other than lubricants. Then plate exposure. Now, plate exposure is a very, very serious problem. You will not even have a bleb formation, obviously. And in this particular case, again, NVG. I have found that, you know, uh, neovascular glaucoma and post-VR surgery, you tend to get most complications related to tubes. So again, same problem. You have to have antibiotic prophylaxis. You have to consider resuturing. Um, you know, use whatever means to put it back together. But I have seen that when such uh, exposure occurs for the plate, it usually needs to be explanted. Then tube blockage. Now, this was very interesting. You can see the tube there. This was in a case of... Um, uh, therapeutic PK, post-pythium keratitis, where patient developed um, uh, intractable glaucoma. So she had RD put in, um, and you can see fibrin blocking the tube, but her pressure was controlled. And this is why her pressure was controlled, because the fibrin membrane was actually pulsating. So it was draining all right. So, but you can have vitreous, you can have iris, you can have blood, you can even have silicon oil. Sorry, we move on. So here you can see the um, uh, peaked pupil that gives you an idea that that is actually vitreous being uh, blocking. And here, this is a case of silicon oil in an aphic child where it blocked the tube. So, um, and in this particular case, look at this, this is, uh, within six months of surgery, the tube is pretty long. You have silicon around the tube, but not blocking. Actually, it was still not blocking, but it collected around and you can see how much it had retracted. So one has to be very mindful of that also, that retraction is pretty common. In this particular case, ASOCT is showing that it has retracted into the cornea. And that is a very uh, potent cause of hypotony and corneal decompensation. It's not hypotony, sorry, corneal decompensation, uh, corneal edema and corneal decompensation. So what I do routinely now in silicon oil, you can see the inverse hypopian in a, another one, one eyed patient who had uh, redetachment following silicon oil removal for the first time. So second time it wasn't even removed and I put it uh, in. You can see the lots of fenestrations in the intraocular portion. And so there is no silicon collecting at the uh, tip of the tube. Those, these are all the fenestrations that uh, help divert, let's put it this way. Then tubes retract. I showed you a case, therefore I feel slightly longer is definitely better. You, you should be avoiding the visual axis, but even if it's in the visual axis, I have seen that it does not affect vision. And why longer? Because it allows for some degree of retraction, especially in growing eyes. Now, in this particular case of IC syndrome, ICE syndrome, you can see polychoria. You can see that the tube has retracted a little bit. The opening is away from the edge of the anterior capsule. And here it has reached the uh, fibrous edge of the anterior capsule due to retraction. So retraction occurs, therefore longer is better. I feel that. Another case of post-PK glaucoma, which was managed with the tube. Here you can see the full lumen. You can't see the full tube, but you can see the full lumen. And later on, and this is a fixed pupil. The pupil, you know, is uh, fixed with pass. So you can see a few months later, 
the tube has moved in position and you can only see partial lumen. Then tube endothelium touch. Now this is where you start getting corneal edema. In this, this particular case, unfortunately, a one-eyed, one, once again, a one-eyed angle closure glaucoma who's also had a trab. You can see the trab, the PI related to the trab and the tube, both were done elsewhere. Patient came to me when vision decreased from 2050 to 2000 and could not be managed conservatively with hypersol and things like that. So uh, I talked about reciting the tube, uh, extending it and reciting. See, it's a small tube, so I cannot recite it into the sulcus unless I extend it. Extenders are expensive, extenders are uh, very bulky also. So I don't like extenders. I use a Venflon tube to extend. So uh, unfortunately, COVID intervened and this is how he ended up, I think eight months later when he came back. And um, this is the Venflon tube. I recited it. I created a broad uh, iridectomy. Um, recited with Venflon tube and he, uh, this is pre-PK. The patient has since then undergone a PK also. Right, so you avoid AC tube in shallow eyes. I like to put them in the uh, sulcus. So let's talk a little bit about the um, randomized control trials that have looked uh, uh, at Barwelt as well as Emma. There are two studies. Um, uh, well, uh, of great note, uh, AVB and ABC, A versus B, Ahmed versus Bawelt or Ahmed Bawel comparison. Um, you can see Ahmed Bawel comparison has uh, Professor Keith Parton as one of the uh, authors, co authors. Right. So, what, what did they find? They found that in uh, AVB study, found that there was more failure with AGV. And this was statistically significant, whereas uh, ABC did not find this to be very different. Well, it was different, but it was not statistically significant. So what was the difference? I think the difference was in the uh, I, uh, success criterion. AVB used 5 to 18, whereas ABC used 6 to 21. Therefore, that, that difference might have occurred. Okay. Then look at the pressure, AGV 16.6 in AVB, 14.7 in ABC, whereas it was 13.6 with Bowelt, 12.7 with Bowelt, and both were obviously significantly lower, uh, different, sorry, the uh, um, Bowelt was significantly lower. Uh, AVB found that lesser medication was required in Bowelt, but ABC did not find that. Okay, then where the complications were concerned, the bowel did have more hypotony and that was significant um, in both the studies. Then failure due to just IOP was much higher in both studies in the AGV group. And in both cases, it was statistically significant. Repeat surgery was again higher in the Ahmed glaucoma valve group not significant in the AVB study, but significant in the ABC study. And loss of vision was um, significantly lower in the uh, uh, bowel group. Right, now the design of Adi, as I told you, is based on the bowel 350, but very few studies have been done with direct comparison. There are a couple which show them to be uh, pretty relatable pretty comparable. So when I looked at RD versus AGV, and this is at one year follow-up, you can see that in RD, the pressure stays below AGV at the final follow-up uh, visit. And the medication also required for RD is much lower compared to the um, uh, AGV. Now, there is a study, a fairly uh, large one from Chandigarh, PJ Chandigarh. Uh, they have found that the overall success was 73% in RD at three years and 58 in AGV, but this was not statistically significant and they too found more hypotony in RD. Please remember that my study, it's a single surgeon one, whereas the one from Chandigarh was not. Um, so most studies that have compared valve versus non-valve have reported that um, mostly with 
previous filtration surgery, whether it is primary or secondary. So um, these have revealed that non valve GDD is capable of achieving significantly lower IOP with reduced need for medication. Stud some studies have reported more complications with non valve GDD. What I found is that there are several studies which have listed previous glaucoma surgery as factors for failure. So I looked at my data once again, and this publication is pending, so I will just be very brief about it. 126 size, almost 20 months follow-up in both. Both groups were very well matched preoperatively, and both uh, led to reduction in IOP and number of AGM in the early postoperative period. This is what we are interested in. Are they brought about a, a pressure of 12.9, AGV 15.2? This difference was statistically significant. And lower, sorry, lower number of medications for RD group compared to AGV group. Um, Complete success was better and total success was better in the RD group. And you can see that Kaplan Meyer survived in there. Complications were again lower in the RD group rather than the AGV group. And the interventions and serious complications, however, were not statistically different. Uh, hypertensive phase, I got about 23% in RD and uh, almost double that in AGV. That was significant. Failure again was more in the AGV group. And when I looked at multivariate analysis, hypertensive phase and AGV both turned out to be significant. So the key points are that both RD and AGV are effective. There is no doubt about it. But both intraocular pressure and need for AGM was significantly lower in the RD group. Overall rate of failure significantly lower in the RD group as well. Serious complications were comparable in the two. And therefore, this affordable G GDD obviously has great uh, significance in our country. So GDDs, to summarize, are indicated in refractive, refractive glaucomas where failure of TRAB is anticipated. Even with antifibrotics, more manipulations are required, as I showed you. Initial hypotony is expected and should be managed preemptive preemptively and resultant initial hypertensive phase prior to suture autolysis also should be managed preemptively, okay? non valve tubes are able to achieve lower IOP with lesser medications and meticulous technique helps avoid serious early complications. And in my opinion, it is well worth the pain for the gains. Um, I think I have overstepped, so we will skip express. Um, Thank you for a patient listening. Thank you very much, Vanita. It was very elaborative and excellent lecture. You have covered almost uh, most of the things. Uh, just the uh, small things for the PG students because they have asked quite a few questions. Most important, you know, the ball surgery is not a primary surgery for primary glaucomas. Most yeah. of the time it's reserved for the secondary glaucomas and the complicated cases. And the success rate of the valve surgery is obviously in my experience it's, is lesser and that is what Vanita has also showed in many studies. It's lesser than that what we get with the trabeculectomy. The simple reason is that when you do the valve surgery, you do always in the complicated cases. So that's why the trabeculectomy always gives a better outcome as compared to the valve surgery. So there are many more questions. Obviously, as the discussion will go on, we will ask. And before that, I would ask Dr. Harsh to give his comments. Thank you, Pratip. And thank you, Vanita, for a wonderful presentation, uh, clarifying most of the things very, very nicely. And just a few points I want to add on. Uh, one thing is that many a times when the anterior chamber is shallow and you can't even go into the pars plana and especially in PKs and such other situations, uh, one may like to do what is known as a pars plana valve or a posterior valve that we call, in which we go three millimeters behind. The rest of the procedure is entirely similar, but we do a complete vitrectomy. So you have to have a good vitreous surgeon uh, he, he'll have to induce PVD 
do a full vitrectomy and then place that tube behind. And very rightly, like Vanita said, uh, the tube has to be long so that you can, uh, you don't, it doesn't get hidden here and there. And initially we were worried that it is in the vitreal axis, but nothing actually happens and the patients are usually very happy with the reduced pressure. Second thing is that uh, I think uh, <coughs> you have to cover the tube by sclera and uh, many a times, especially in the, in, and what I have been doing and what uh, George, and I would like to put this name, uh, George Kurthan was the man in uh, uh, Arvind who actually developed the Adi well with great efforts and brought the technology to India in a cheaper way. So he also has now shifted back to doing uh, that, uh, doing an autosclera. So you make a scleral patch or of the same oil, just like a trap patch or just put an incision over there and go in and then the rest of the tube we cover by the sclera. The advantage is that the area near the cornea and the limbus which may be exposed at times is not covered by the white sclera which sometimes looks very scary especially if it is in the inferior quadrant. You can also cover it by uh, cornea which is useless other, for other uh, practical purposes then you can use those kind of corneas which will not reflect it out. And again, like uh, Vanita showed, the priming of the valve, just to check that the valve is open, when you are doing it with the AGV valve, you have to do it first under high pressure and then also under low pressure to check that the, valve, the uh, fluid is draining even at lower pressures. So, and, uh, and uh, uh, like she showed you how to tie the knot and for somebody who may try it out, I must confess that once you have done these things for years and years, you get into all kinds of complications. The first time I, I tied the knot, I was, I was so this thing strong that I actually split the tube into two. So you have to be careful while tying the knot that you don't break the tube into two, which is quite possible uh, uh, happening. And uh, flat AC can very well also occur with EGV if the, uh, if the valve is not okay. And sometimes the entry leak, you have not checked the priming properly. So uh, these are some of the points that I wanted to put forward. Pratip, please go ahead with the. Yeah, you know, there are quite a few uh, very difficult situations, particularly, you know, when the broad buckle has been put uh, into the eye. So you don't have a space to put the wall. And uh, the other is when the conjunctiva is totally fibrous, you don't have any space to put the wall. The third, if the conjunctiva and tenons is very thin and very fragile, then you you tend to uh, you know, uh, do lots of complication. And in these cases, the plate exposure, what Vanita has showed one case, you know, I have two, three cases of that kind where the total plate has come out and it's very difficult to manage these cases because you can take out that wall, but where to put the other? The inferior also, if the, if the 360 degree broad buckle was put, then you don't have a space even in the inferior form links. So these are very difficult situations, but I don't think that uh, the PG has to uh, worry about all these things because these things will not be asked uh, to them in the examination. But some of them, Manita has really asked a, a good question. Uh, say, for example, you know, one PG has asked, do you do the needling uh, in the wall in the same way as you do <laughs> after in the trabeculectomy? Needling in valves, actually, I have tried. It doesn't work. So um, I have uh, initial, it, it comes down, pressure comes down, and it goes back up. That's because the fibrosis that occurs around these plates is way tougher than the encapsulation that happens in uh, trabeculectomy. So I have given up needling. Uh, I may still consider blebectomy, but even that I have seen doesn't work. Um, even literature says that, you know, the, uh, the um, results are equivocal. And um, so possibly the, if it's the only seeing eye, then I will give another tube a chance. And 
um, you know, uh, having said that, just today I have booked another patient for whom I did an Adi. And he's again one eye. They are all difficult cases, you know. Uh, I I am not keen to do a, a, a transcleral diode for such such an individual. He's angle closure, so you know I can't do any kind of you know trabeculotomy or whatever just to bide my time. So I think uh, the best thing is to do a second tube. Uh, I seem to remember one um, Eels disease young patient for whom I uh, had done an AGV initially and it didn't work. Um, and for him, I did a blebectomy that also did not work. So then came COVID and he said, I don't want, uh, I said, uh, let's let's go for an RV this time. He said, no, I want, uh, I don't want, it. you know, there's too much hassle. I want a laser. I said, okay, fine, laser. And then laser also did not work. And now I've done an RV for him and he's doing good. So they are so tough. They are really tough cases. Where sometimes, sometimes these secondary glaucomas are 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 uh, very very difficult to manage, and you have to have some plan ready for these. Um, you know, um, especially the only eyed individuals. Uh, one one more very interesting question: Why patients have a hypertensive face? I explained that uh, we don't know the exact reason, but any kind of encapsulation, fibrosis, all happens because of cytokines, inflammatory factors. So with the valved tubes, the uh, aqueous with its cytokines and pro-inflammatory uh, cells or whatever you may call it, they have access to the plate and the plate area from the very beginning. So perhaps that's the reason why there is excessive uh, fibrosis in those, those particular cases. And it is generally delayed for uh, Adi because you have occluded it completely. There is no aqueous between conjunctiva and plate in the first five to six weeks. So it allows for a thin fibrous capsule formation without any aqueous reaching the area. And therefore, the uh, the occurrence of hypertensive phase is less compared to uh, hematoma. It takes little time to develop the equilibrium. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So another is uh, related to that. When to remove the repot suture if the IOP is very high? Yeah, I see. Um, good friend, Professor Nazrul Islam, he's <laughs> sent that question. Yes. Um, uh, I would never do it before six weeks uh, because that's the outer, really the outer time when the uh, suture aut autolysis occurs. But having said that, sometimes I've gone in and uh, used laser. If I can still see the ridge in, in an Adi, then it means that the, um, the uh, autolysis has not occurred. So I may use laser to, to um, do a suture lysis. But if the ridge is not visible, it means that that suture has fallen off. It means that now removal of the rib cord is what we need to do to control the pressure. So that is generally after six weeks, not before six weeks. How to check the non-functioning GTD? And if it is non-functioning GTD... Then Only with the IOP. If Ahmed glaucoma valve... I showed you that graph of mine. Ahmed glaucoma valve, in the first week, you get the lowest of the low pressures. Meaning, you know, uh, single digits or early teens. You generally don't get very high pressure unless you've left a little bit of viscoelastic in the AC purposely, whatever, for whatever reason, you want to keep it. Back. In FAK guys, I would also do a partial ligature. I don't want a choroidal formation. So uh, even in AGV, I would do a partial ligature. So um, even with partial ligature, you're not expecting pressures of 40 or 50 on day one with AGV. If you're getting 40s and 50s on day one, that means that the tube has not been uh, primed well. Um, I have um, actually gone in and primed the tube um, after, three weeks after AGV. So, uh, uh, a patient was sent to me with, uh, with um, 
AGV being done and the pressure really, really high. So I have done it um, in inside the eye. It's not difficult to do. You just need your intraocular forceps and uh, you, you can hold it and you can just prime it. How do you know? Immediately after that, the pressure starts falling. One PG student asked that, uh, you know, if they, they were asked in the examination, which wall would you put, Burwelt or Ahmed, and why? <laughs> well, I think now they are well equipped with their answer. It's up to them to decide. <laughs> it's really up to them. I have given them the pros and cons of both, both tubes, not valves. Both tubes now is definitely AGV is safer, and that is why we choose still choose AGV despite its cost, despite the fact that it has high, so much hypertensive phase, despite the fact that failure rate is high. But in the early postoperative period, it is possibly the safer uh, well uh, tube to use. Uh, I I would do it. I consider it. Uh, quite often in one-eyed individuals whose pressure remains very high uh, even with maximum medication. If the pressure is controlled, then, uh, you know, or is sort of not more than mid to late 20s with medication, I have done RV in one-eyed individuals also because I take preemptive measures. I, I make sure that uh, not only is it occluded well, the two or three ligatures. Now I routinely do two or three ligatures, but also in front of it, I do fenestrations and I leave uh, these vital stents for drainage. So to control pressure, the initial five to six weeks. One more question. You know, we have addressed it a number of times. Again, this question has come up. How long the atropine should be given in a malignant glaucoma? Yeah, you know, some in the, uh, uh, patients have are on atropine for a lifetime. Sometimes you cannot withdraw it, especially if, um, you know, uh, it's uh, recurring and it, it can recur. Medical management, as I was telling you, the figures that are quoted in uh, studies are that 10, only 10 to 25% resolve. And that too, I... Uh, figure it happens only when you use long-term atropine, lifetime sometimes. So if uh, ever you have to give the long-term atropine, ever you tried the low concentration of the atropine, which is available Myatro. nowadays, treat the Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have. I I don't actually. The the one and only patient where um, it did resolve with atropine, the patient was not willing to continue it for a lifetime for the blur. They just didn't want it because that lady actually only came for uh, cataract surgery. And following cataract surgery, she got aqueous misdirection because it, she, she had unrecognized angle closure. Gonioscopy was not done prior to surgery. And then the, she was referred to me with high pressures. What, what would you do? Would you like to give the lifetime atropine or would you like to go for the atropine? I would go for surgical, uh, you know, uh, management. If the patients are happy, they don't want surgery and the atropine is working well, okay. Mm -hmm. There are always two sides to the coin. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harsh, your final comments? No, no, I think she has done wonderfully well and... Uh, explain practically everything and that is a tricky part because for the PGs it is like I think Pratip also explained because they are only going to just one thing I want to reiterate that maybe you will be seeing a valve uh, more often than uh, actually doing or do, to do anything with it the patient would have been done somewhere else and would be coming to you so for God's sake please what is happening every day is the people are just looking at the tube in the center and they are not bothering to look anywhere else. Uh -huh. They are missing the exposure. So please tell them to look down or look up or wherever the tube is and please see the entire path of the tube. Because if there is the slightest exposure, the patient is going to end up in endoscopy. And then that is a disaster for all of us. Yeah, uh, I'm really glad you brought this point up because 
Uh, I remember I had um, uh, a patient, I was on leave, a patient had come uh, and uh, it was noted everything is okay, you know, not, not specifically that the patch graft was seen or the plate, uh, the bleb was seen, but it says everything, everything stable. And three days later, patient came with fulminant end of helmitis, fulminant, had to remove not just the tube, had to remove the eye. So it is, it, it, you know, these are very serious site threatening complications. They have to be taken seriously and they have to be managed appropriately. So thank you very much, uh, Manita and Dr. Harsh. You know, it was wonderful, excellent talk. We enjoyed thoroughly and I'm sure that uh, all the PGs must have learned a lot. And I'm sure that, you know, they will they will go and watch, and, uh, watch it again and again because uh, there are too many things to learn. <laughs> yes, you. You, don't, you don't follow it in the first lecture, that's for no. sure. Um, what I also wanted to say is that every single PG who's watching, you are more than welcome to actually um, write to me, email me, and whenever I get the time, I will reply to your questions. I have no problems with that at all. My email was, you know, in this particular uh, talk, because we didn't get to the thank you slide, it's not there, but in my TRAB one, it is there in the thank you slide. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hall, Dr. Vanita. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Good night.